Good evening, everyone, um, and welcome to tonight's um, edition of CF Live. Um, my name is Rob Reynolds, and I'm an adult with CF, and I'm going to be your host for tonight. Um, and the reason why I'm, I'm hosting is that I am uh, the CF representative who went to the UK CF conference last week. Um, now, the UK CF conference is the Cystic Fibrosis Trust's annual research conference. It provides an opportunity for the trust to showcase research that they're funding and for researchers and clinicians and healthcare professionals uh, in the UK to attend the conference and network, establish new collaborations and, and the benefits that that brings. A particular focus of this year's conference was addressing the recently refreshed CF research priorities, which I, I'm going to mention again in a second. So to kick off tonight, um, I'm just going to give you five thoughts that I had um, uh, from the perspective of an adult with CF attending this event to say what I thought of today. Um, find where I've got my notes. So my first thought was something that struck me right at the beginning of the conference before any of the talks even started. And that was just the sheer number of delegates who were present at the conference. And the reason this struck me is because I suddenly thought every single person here, their career and professional life is dedicated to the condition that I have. And that was, was quite overwhelming. Um, and especially bearing in mind, I couldn't even see everyone who was present at the conference because it was held as a hybrid conference with, with more people attending virtually than the ones who were uh, there in the room. Um, all the researchers who spoke were frighteningly clever and uh, we're going to hear from some of them later. Um, so I felt very sure that our, our future is in safe hands. And so my second thought is also about these researchers, that um, it's not just a job for them. Um, they're all passionate and really excited about what they do. And uh, in some of the breaks um, during the conference, I uh, took the opportunity to go and talk to some of the researchers. Um, and I quite enjoyed softly dropping in, oh yeah, actually, um, I've had a chronic infection of the bug that you're studying. Or, um, oh, I actually have the mutation that you're researching and investigating. And it was, it was quite fun to see their reactions and particularly some of them, that their face would light up um, and start asking me questions because um, they actually had that opportunity to talk to a real life person who, um, whose life might end up being improved as a result of the, the work and research that they're doing. My third thought, um, was about the, a, a common thread throughout the whole day um, about the importance of input into CF research by us, the CF community. Um, and personally, I, I take part in lots of um, involvement activities and perhaps this is a good advert for other people to get involved and do the same. And you know, this applies whether you're an adult with CF, child with CF or, or a parent of a child with CF. It sort of feels a bit like steering some sort of giant ocean liner. We, we can't make it go faster and we can't make it suddenly go in a different direction, but we can help to have one hand on the, on the tiller and help them to steer it in the right direction. My fourth thought was, um, leads on from that, the one specific thing, which I've already mentioned, um, which is the, the James Lind Alliance list of priorities for CF research. Uh, now, this was something that the community had an opportunity to contribute to fairly recently when CF was the first condition where that list of priorities was uh, refreshed from the original one um, that was created some years ago. And this list of refreshed priorities, which as I say was a focus of the conference, um, appeared on people's presentation slides no fewer than five times. It might have been more, but I, my tally got up to five. 
And it just really struck me how important it was almost like these are the 10 commandments of, of CF research being used today. And that, and it wasn't just a, a, a list to come up with and go, yes, isn't that nice? The, the researchers are taking note and they're using that <clears throat> as um, their guide for what should I research? What, you know, what should I um, try and investigate? And my final thought, um, which is something we perhaps don't actively think about um, every single day, <laughs> um, is about the UK CF registry, um, whose 2022 annual report had come out just a few days before the conference. And the reason this struck me is because as a person with CF, I probably didn't really think twice when my clinic asked my consent to be able to submit my data to form part of this registry. We get asked to consent to all sorts of things in our uh, in our clinic visits. And I, as I say, I probably didn't think twice about it, but actually seeing that resulting annual registry report, which is basically the closest thing to a complete census of um, the state of play of CF, the CF population every single year. It's an absolute goldmine of information that's just there, available and easy to tap into. So I wanted to sort of say, well done to everyone with CF who gave that consent, even if you didn't think much about it. It's really important that, that we're helping to drive the research and to help them um, be able to have the data to look at the impacts of how that research plays out. So those were my five thoughts, but my other, my little uh, epilogue was saying that one of my favorite bits of the day was seeing my old pediatric consultant who's, who's on this call tonight and getting to have a selfie when she remembered me, even though I'm now in my mid thirties. Great. So I'm gonna now move on to the second part of tonight's um, uh, tonight's CF Live event, where we're going to hear from some guest speakers um, who were all present at the conference as well. Um, they are early career researchers. Um, so they all gave a talk on the day. They only had, I think, three minutes on the day, but they've got seven minutes tonight. So hopefully that, that will uh, give them the chance to really bring their research to life for us. Um, and they also all had some posters up on the day which were very interesting. Um, I have to say a, a, a vote of thanks to three other people at CF, who I'm not sure if they're on the call tonight, but um, Jess, Rupert and Izzy, thanks very much for doing some uh, preparatory work with our presenters to sort of um, uh, sense check the, the talks we're about to hear from the perspective of um, people with CF, especially if they don't have a scientific background. So we've got four, four talks to hear tonight, um, and I'm going to hand over to our first presenter, who is Diana Vesely. Hello, my name is uh, Diana. I'm from, from, I'm from the University of Bristol, where I'm using computer simulations to investigate the effect of Ivocaftor on the cystic fibrosis causing protein. We're often told to consume proteins for a healthy diet. But in the world of biology, proteins are more than just dietary components. They are like tiny machines inside our bodies doing important jobs. One of them is um, CFTR, the protein linked to cystic fibrosis. This is how the CFTR protein looks like. In my research, we consider all the individual atoms that make up the CFTR protein. Um, but because this is very complex to look at, um, we usually use this spaghetti representation, which helps us understand the structure more easily. So the main thing to remember is that CFTR has a special structure, and my work is all about understanding that structure. Ivocaftor is a groundbreaking therapy that rescues 97 cystic fibrosis-causing mutations. Scientists have captured a snapshot of the CFTR protein in the presence of Ivocaftor, shown here in pink. Despite this great discovery of the structure, there's still a missing piece to this puzzle. 
how does ivocaflor influence the structure and movements of this protein? That's where my work comes in. I'm peering into the tiniest details to reveal how the CFTR protein behaves in response to ivocaftor through computer simulations, like using a computational microscope. The CFTR protein is embedded in the border of cells, such as in the lungs, and is constantly in motion. But our snapshots of CFTR structure are just frozen moments in time. So to truly understand it, we need a special tool to watch this little dance it does unfold. That's where molecular dynamic simulations come in. These simulations bring CFTR's dynamic movements back to life. On the right side, I'm showing a picture of my molecular dynamic simulation box. With this powerful technique, I recreate as close as we can get the environment encountered by the CFDR protein in the lungs. Here you see CFDR sitting in the border of cells surrounded by salt and water. These simulations allow us to see how each atom of the CFDR protein moves over periods of time. We've discussed how molecular dynamic simulations reveal the dynamic movements of the CFDR protein over time. Now, our goal is to capture, is to examine the changes that occur within the protein in response to ivocaftor. To achieve this, we use a second method, suddenly removing the drug and observing how the protein strives to return to its pre ivocaftor state. It's almost like reverse engineering the process. To carry out this technique, we built upon the molecular dynamic simulations we discussed earlier, incorporating additional steps. To explain this approach in more detail, let's turn to Bob the light bulb. Here's Bob. He's holding a weight. Suddenly, the weight vanishes. Bob is shocked and responds to the loss of the weight. His muscles relax, first in his hand, in fingers, hands, and face, then in his arms and shoulders, and lastly in his legs. Thus, Bob's response can be mapped over time. To summarize, in my research, I use computer simulations to understand how the CFDR protein behaves around ivocaftor. First, I create different starting points for the protein's behavior using molecular dynamic simulations that then I use for my second time of sim type of simulations where I suddenly remove ivocaftor. Similar to what happened to Bob the light bulb, I can then track how information moves within the protein, revealing the pathways that connect the place where ivocaftor binds to important bits of the protein involved in its function. After our detailed analysis, we create a special map that tells us which parts of the protein move and which do not using colors. Here I'm showing several snapshots of, from this map depicting the protein's response over five nanoseconds after removing ivocaftor, similar to how Bob the light bulb reacts when the weight is lifted. The dark blue areas show bits of the protein that stay still, while the red um, colors show bits of the protein that move a lot in response to the disappearance of ivocaftor. This map helps us identify how ivocaftor influences the function of the CFDR protein. Different mutations of CFDR show different dances, such as on the show Strictly Come Dancing. Using my simulations, I'm exploring how ivocaftor rescues various cystic fibrosis mutations shown here as spheres on the CFDR structure. Once this phase is complete, I plan to broaden the scope of my research to investigate the conformational changes caused in CFDR by the triple combination therapy shown here on the right. Ultimately, my work holds the potential to contribute to the development of improved therapies for cystic fibrosis. Thank you very much for your attention.
That's great. Thanks very much, Diana. That was really interesting to see how there's still research going on, even to drugs that, that we're all taking now, or that many of us are taking now. Um, so our next speaker is Nicole Kapner. And just to give an advance warning, during this talk, there will be a point where there are some um, pictures of what a CF pancreas looks like and, and the damage that might be done. Um, hopefully Nicole will give a more specific timing of when that might be coming in case you want to look away at that point or you might find it upsetting. Good evening everyone. Um, thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much um, for allowing me to present. Um, my research is looking into the impact of cystic fibrosis on pancreatic cells. And the pancreas itself is located in the abdomen, and it's made up of two big parts. The biggest part is the exocrine pancreas, and this makes up up to 95% of the organ. And the task of this part is to produce the digestive juices to break down the food. And here we have asana cells, duct cells, and also blood vessels. And then we also have the second part, which is the endocrine pancreas. This makes up just up to 5% of the whole organ. And the task of this part is blood sugar regulation. We have different cell types here, and uh, these cells are grouped together in little kind of sphere, spheres, which are called islets of Langerhans. When we look closer into these islets, we have different cell types, and the two important ones are beta cells, which produce a hormone called insulin, and we also have alpha cells, which produce a hormone called glucagon. And these two hormones help to regulate blood sugar um, levels after a meal or during fasting. If we look into CF-related diabetes, we know that CF is impacting in the pancreas as well, as a lot of people with CF have exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, which means the exocrine pancreas is not working properly. It's also impacting on the endocrine pancreas, as we know that 33 to 50% of adults with CF can develop diabetes, which shows up with impaired insulin secretion. There are lots of studies already done to kind of try and find out what's going on. And they found that there's a reduction in the amount of beta cells, which produce insulin. And there's also a reduction in their functional capacity of producing this hormone. But the exact mechanisms of the development of CFDR are not yet understood. So the um, kind of research group I'm working on is trying to investigate this from different angles. And for my specific project, I'm uh, trying to answer the question if scarring and inflammation in the pancreas is playing a part in the development of CF-related diabetes. And more specific, uh, for this part, I want to understand if there are alpha cells and beta cells, which produce a transitional marker, which is a specific protein, which we believe is a sign of change in these cells due to stress. And for my research, I'm using pieces from CF and non-CF pancreas tissue, which are fixed and uh, cut in thin sections. And I use histology stains to visualize the appearance of whole tissue pieces and immunological staining to visualize specific proteins of interest, which I will explain in a few slides. Here we see a non-CF pancreas, what it looks like when we look down the microscope. The majority of the pancreas is kind of bluish color, and this is the asana tissue. And here in the middle, we see two islets. I now will, uh, on the next slide, two slides show um, the CF tissue. So if you want to look away, that's uh, no. And here we see the CF pancreas. It looks very different. We have um, no asana tissue here left. We see a lot of um, red kind of scarring here in uh, the pancreas. And we also see a lot of fat cells, which are these um, empty structures throughout the whole tissue. Uh, but however, we still see the islets, which are these uh, kind of round structured clustered together. So the islets are still there. And um, I'm also marking specific proteins, which are with, with a technique called immunostaining. Here I use antibodies which just attach to this protein and the antibodies themselves have a color on them and these colors we can see under the microscope. 
And this is how it looks like under the microscope. We see on the left an islet of uh, a CF pancreas and on the right an islet of a non-CF pancreas. In red, we see the beta cells, in pink, the alpha cells, in green, the transitional marker, which is the specific protein I'm interested in, and in blue, the nuclei, which helps us to understand how many cells are in which area. And for this um, project, I wanted to know if there are any beta or alpha cells which have this transitional marker. So I was looking under the microscope if I see any cells which express red and green or pink and green. And what I found is that in CF and also non-CF pancreas, I found alpha cells which express this transitional marker. And some examples are marked with uh, the arrows here. And we were wondering, especially in non-CF pancreas, what could be the reason for the stress marker to be expressed? And uh, so we investigated uh, a few of the stains and we think that scarring can have something to do with it. And um, Belinda uh, kindly helped me with uh, the picture of an islet uh, pictured as pomegranate. And so we have the different uh, cell types, which are the little seeds, and um, the surrounding white segment could be uh, a symbol for the scarring. So if we have less scarring, we see less trans of this transitional phenotype. And on the right hand side, if we have more scarring, more of this white outer segment, uh, we see more of this transitional phenotype. So taken together, I found uh, this transitional phenotype present in the CF pancreas, where we know a lot of scarring is uh, appearing. And we found it also in non-CF pancreas, where we saw scarring uh, in the kind of close environment of the islets. And we're interested in this kind of uh, mechanism and want to study this further because we hope that we possibly can rescue the islet function. We see that they're still there, they're just not happy to function uh, properly and secrete the insulin, which is needed. And we hope that um, we could use some medication, which are already approved for other diseases where scarring occurs in other tissues, and therefore rescue the islet function and help people who already had an impact on the pancreas before the modulator treatment or who cannot take the modulator therapy. With that, I'm at the end of my talk. I want to thank everyone involved in this project uh, and also in the lab and some people you can see here on this picture. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Nicole. Uh, I'm not sure I will see pomegranates in the same way again. Um, and uh, we'll move uh, swiftly on to our third talk. And we're now going to hear from Lucille Hubert. Oh, hi, everyone. Um, so my PhD is um, on testing novel therapeutics against the CF pathogenized Bergdermal Florence. So it's part of the Pipe CF Strategic uh, Research Center. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so this is a really um, basic kind of draft discovery pipeline. So you have the discovery phase in which um, you find this new compound and you wonder if you can be used as a new medicine, which went to the preclinical phase where you convert this promising chemical into a new medicine through loads of testing. And then finally the clinical phase where you have the clinical trial. So the Pipe CF um, Center focuses on the preclinical phase and we try to develop a whole new set of clinical tests to determine how effective antibiotics are specifically for um, CF infections. So this goes from picking up the right bacteria because they're not all adapted to it. And then my job in particular is to adapt these models that are usually made from pseudomonas into Bergdera because they don't work quite the same. So the really interesting aspect of my PhD is that I get to use Bergdera to treat other Bergdera infection. So the good aspect of Bergdera, which you probably haven't heard of, comes from the production of specialized metabolites. So these are compounds that are produced by bacteria, plants, fungi, that are not evolving and growth, they're kind of bonus compounds that they produce. And some of them are really good, specifically in Bergdera, you can have uh, biopesticides. So these are just pesticides that are, non, that are not made from chemicals. Um, and Bergdera gadoli uh, produces the basin, which actually helps key crops uh, to protect them against a disease. And they also produce um, different antibiotics. So the one I'll be talking about today is NSM2A, which 
has been found to be active against burglar and watch crimes, and is why I'm testing further in my PhD. But you probably know the bad aspects of burglar area. So they're known CF1 pathogens, so the Cebicia complex in the latest um, registry has been shown to cause about 4% of CF1 infections. And here's highlighted, you can see the multivirance has become the dominant burglar to infect uh, people with CF. They also have multiple mechanisms of drug resistance. That means they can, they resist to many, many different antibiotics. Um, and this is because they have naturally present uh, resistance. So they don't necessarily acquire loads during an infection like you have, may have heard of, they just naturally have them. And this is why we need new antibiotics. So the antibiotics that next to my PhD, that's currently free. So we have a new one, NSLoxin, and we also test uh, to compare with meropenem and trimethoprim, which can be prescribed to treat uh, burglary infections. As you can see, they all have kind of different target in the cell, which helps diversify the profile of antibiotics used to minimize uh, resistance or curing. So there are two questions that I'll be answering as kind of the scientific questions uh, from my research. The first one is how does an asoxin compare to the clinically used antibiotics? So this is this this figure here shows you um, the concentration of antibiotics that's needed to kill about eight percent of bacteria, and you can see that anastoloxin has a much lower bar than trimethoprim and meropenem, which means um, that you need a lot less antibiotics to kill a lot of burgundy, which is really good. Um, and then I've looked at, at if anastoloxin can prevent the formation of biofilms. So biofilm are kind of these groups of bacteria that form a sticky kind of bit like glue matrix or kind of environment. Um, and in this environment, it makes it really hard for antibiotics to penetrate and then kill bacteria. So we're interested in seeing if we can actually prevent the formation from happening. Um, and here on this graph, you show how good antibiotics are reducing bio. If, if uh, our fourth speaker, Michaela, is able to take over the screen share, I'm going to suggest that we move on to our fourth speaker, Michaela, and then if we get Lucille back, we'll um, revert and, and listen to the, the last part of her talk. Okay, so the title of my talk is Chronic Infection with Staph aureus Mitigates the Negative Effects of Pseudomonas Originosa. And I realise that's a bit of a mouthful, but I've broken it down into bite-sized chunks and hopefully everything will become a bit clearer. So lung infections in CF, who's there? Um, the CF lung doesn't often look like this, where there's just one bacteria present there. It often tends to look like this, where there's multiple species present um, at the same time. And this gets a little bit complex because they can all talk to each other and uh, communicate with the host as well. So um, these infections can be happening at the same time. And this is what we would term co-infections. And what are chronic infections? So I'm particularly interested in chronic infections, and that is because you know common bugs like the two that I'm interested in, but other bugs as well, over time in the CF lung, they are persistent and they can develop adaptations to um to the environment to really succeed in there. And these adaptations can inc include mucoidy, uh, becoming antibiotic resistant and also hiding from immune cells. So that makes them really quite difficult to treat and it um, leads to inflammation and lung damage. So that's what we mean by chronic co-infections. And why Pseudomonas and Staph? Well, Pseudomonas and Staph are two of the most common CF bugs and they have this opposite pattern of infection where Staph tends to be more common in children here and then Pseudomonas takes over um, in adulthood. This led researchers to think uh, and focus on competition initially. However, there's increasing evidence that they can coexist. And one third of people with CF are co-infected with both pseudomonas and staph in the UK. So we thought it was um, clearly an important interaction to study. And that's why I'm focusing on chronic co-infections with pseudomonas and staph. So the hypothesis for this work was given that increased tolerance is required for coexistence for them to be uh, in the lung at the same time. We thought co-infection is associated with less severe respiratory health outcomes. And to investigate this, I used a 21 year data set. So like Rob highlighted, you know, the CF uh, patient registry data 
is uh, a gold mine of information for us. And I use demographic data, so things like um, age, BMI, uh, CFTI mutation type, CF-related diabetes, um, all those variables, as well as treatments. Um, and I looked at two clinical outcomes, which were FEV1 and IV days. Um, so to uh, look at the infection, the registry does uh, record some information on infection type. We wanted to be really clear on um, the categories of infection. So to do this, uh, I took all of the microbiology culture data, which was sent to the clinical lab at the Royal Brompton Hospital, and we classified the infections into chronic, positive or negative. And this was according to a criteria for pseudomonas known as the LEADS criteria, which is a criteria that um, doctors have come up with um, to categorize pseudomonas infections. And it means that you have to provide at least three samples in one year and more than 50% of them have to be positive. So that's what chronic meant in this study. And then positive meant that there was a positive culture, but the, um, the person didn't meet the LEADS criteria. A negative was a lack of positive cultures for that organism at all. So what did the statistical analysis show? You can see here um, in the bottom, pseudomonas infection worsening from negative to positive to fully chronic. And you can see on the y-axis here, the change in FEV1. So when a uh, staff is completely absent from an infection, these stars signify statistical significance so that the test found this was a significant decline in FEV1. And we can see that a similar trend is seen for when staff is present, but in a positive manner. Um, but this trend is not observed. So there's no significant difference between um, these three dots when uh, staff was present in a chronic co-infection. So this meant that, um, chronic co-infection with pseudomonas and staph wasn't causing a, a decline in FEV1. Um, and we thought, is this because people with chronic co-infections are being treated more aggressively? So we looked at uh, the number of IV days and you can see here that as pseudomonas worsens from negative to positive, there's a small increase in IV days for all the different staph types. However, when we increase um, to the modest infection from positive to chronic, you can see there's no significant difference here when staff is present in a chronic fashion, but there is a really big increase when staff is absent or present in a positive manner. So that meant uh, we concluded that chronic pseudomonas wasn't associated with worse health outcomes in the presence of chronic staff. So what's next for this research? I'm a microbiologist um, by background, and we're looking to see why this is happening. So we are taking, we've I've taken chronic uh, pseudomonas and staph um, bugs from CF sputum, and I'm looking to see um, what molecules are used to communicate with each other, what's happening there so that we can understand this interaction further. And if you or anyone you may know has both pseudomonas and stuff, or is culture in both pseudomonas and stuff, and would like to donate some sputum samples, you can email me and that's my email address. So uh, I'd like to acknowledge all my supervisors and co-authors. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Michaela. Um, I've I had a message to say that we do have Lucille back, um, but she was on her last slide anyway, so um, she'll be available for the Q&A, but we're not going to, to revisit the uh, presentation. So uh, before I forget, because I can't remember whether I said it before or not, um, I just wanted to uh, repeat the thanks to um, Jess, Rupert and Izzy, who are three other people with CF who um, who got advanced um, preview screenings of those talks um, and got to offer some feedback to, to help them um, be the polished presentations we just had now. So that brings us to the last part of, of tonight's talk, which is the Q&A session. Um, and so the, the, the floor is open for questions to any of our four presenters. Um, I dare say if anyone wants to ask me a question, you're welcome to, but um, I'm not sure uh, <laughs> how much I'll know. Um, so you can type your question into the chat, um, or if you do want to ask a question um, via video and talking, then um, I think we can 
field them in that way as well. But uh, be aware that this has been recorded. Uh, so if you do, then your question will be um, will form part of the recording. And we do have some starters for 10. Um, there's no other questions yet forthcoming. Um, and I can't see, have we got, oh yeah, um, we, we have all of our, all of our speakers with cameras back on, I think. Um, so I'm going to ask, first of all, a question to Nicole um, to ask. Um, you showed us what happens with islets in both the CF and non-CF pancreas. Um, do we know anything about modulator versus non-modulator CF pancreases and what effect that might have on the islets? Yes, thank you for your question. Um, there's so far very limited data there yet, so we don't know a lot about it because the modulators are so new and the data we have is a bit contradicting. Some studies shows that the modulator is improving the islet function and some studies did not find any improvement. So I think we have to um, just wait a bit for more studies uh, to publish their results or take their data. Wonderful, thank you. Maybe, maybe the subject for someone else's PhD. <laughs> um, great, um, I'm going to flick to um, uh, a question from Michaela next. Um, just because uh, we had a question which uh, seems to be pretty much just asking is the overall summary of your talk that if you've got chronic in infection of both staph and pseudomonas that that doesn't give additional um, clinical deterioration is that the, the headline so that um so what what I, uh, we compared in in my research was in comparison to chronic pseudomonas alone. So when um, when you see the deterioration that I showed that that was uh, chronic pseudomonas in the absence of staff. So we see that when uh, there's chronic co-infection with both staff and pseudomonas, that there's still some deterioration, but that is not uh, is significantly better than with chronic pseudomonas alone. So that's what uh, we're interested in figuring out why that's happening. So they're sort of like the less of the sum of the less than the sum of their parts, which, yeah. is, which is good. Um, brill. Um, okay. Uh, to field the questions. Um, got a question for Diana, um, which is about. So, so the question is, where does AI feature, um, and. Would, could that be applied to the, the work you're doing in, in computer simulations? Uh, thank you for your question. So at the moment, we're not using any AIs. Um, it's just the computer. Is, these are well-known methods that I built upon. Um, it's a, just a computer that calculates using mathematical equations how each atom moves uh, in a specific time frame. Uh, but it would be interesting to to find a way to use AIs for this project, to expand on this project. So thank you. Wonderful. Um, I know I know it would be Lucille's turn next, but I'm just going to flick to Nicole just because I know Nicole's supervisor who's on the call has to go soon. Um, and so... Yeah. Um, Nicole, we have a question for you about what are, what are the next steps for your research? Um, so we would like to investigate this like relationship of scarring and inflammation a bit in more detail. So we're trying to use different cell models, um, which help us to understand that. And we try to kind of um, look into cells, which we think are kind of messengers in this process, which are in the pancreas. And we also use um, whole kind of very thin slices of the pancreas and try to kind of um, get more information and um, what would be happening in these kind of situations to the islets. And if we could rescue um, 
their function if we kind of adhere kind of treatment to the very stressed environment. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, so uh, Lucille, um, do you have a question in the chat for you? Um, and I guess I suppose also you might, because you got cut off at, at the end, if you do have like a sort of one sentence headline of what, what your outcome was, then do, do begin with that. But um, the question we've got is about, is, is there a potential time scale of how uh, a new antibiotic might ultimately reach a clinical trial? Um, and the person's other question said it looks very exciting. Um, and there's also a sort of second question that you mentioned about the nasty Pocoderia um, causing onion rot and whether that means that we as people see if we try and avoid onions. Um, yeah, really sorry about the internet cutting. We're just moving to a new house, which keeps going in on and off. Um, yeah, so I think most professors can help, but I don't think there's a timeline at the minute for NSOX and going into clinical trials because we're still really early into testing it. Um, so it's probably going to be a few years at least um, because so the work I'm doing in a minute is really trying to see how resistance occurs to this antibiotic to try and see if it would be worth pushing it forward um, to try to understand how bacteria get resistance to it. Um, and then as part of the onions, we've not established a direct link yet between um, these burgers are being present in rotted onions and actually catching it. Um, I should know if you have any idea on that, but I've, I've not read anything about how um, you can catch pledge your life from getting a rotten onion, but it would be definitely interesting to investigate it. Well, thanks. I guess it's always a reminder that lots of these bugs do just exist in nature, and that's what makes it so hard is that anyone can sort of catch it anywhere you know not because they've been risky or dangerous but just because life um well so i've got a question from simon for michaela and i know this was something that was actually mentioned um uh, a, a few times during the conference um which is um for people on modulators it's much harder to get sputum so has that been a challenge for for your research. Um, I know you invited people at the end to send you some samples, but um, has it been difficult in, if, if, in getting a representative sample, given that there might be a lot of people that just can't generate the, the substance you're working with? So um, yeah, the results for, for, this, uh, for this work, we did include everyone with modulators in there because it was um, based on um, registry data. So we adjusted the model. Um, I work with a very, very clever statistician called Jonathan, who was in my acknowledgements, and he um, very amazingly could adjust for all of these variables and take them all into account uh, for the type of modeling that we did. So those people are included. And yes, the relationship still holds um, for anyone on modulators. Um, for my lab work, so I'm very lucky that um, through Jane's um, funding with the CF Trust, she's been able to um, create a repository of isolates. So when sputum was more readily available, the repository started, I think, in 2014 uh, for sort of bonus. So uh, when sputum was more available, we, we collected all of the samples that uh, so basically when you go to your clinic appointment and then you um, send off a sputum sample to the lab, they then do what they need to do with it for their clinical reasons. And then they have a plate, which to them is going to go into a bin, but to us is very uh, valuable for research purposes. So it gets um, picked up by our lab tech and brought into our lab and uh, we culture the bacteria from there and store them in little beads. And then we use them later, they can regrow, they can stably stay in minus 80 for years. Uh, and I've regrown isolates from 2014. So yeah, they stay in there and they are alive at minus 80 and then I put them on a plate years later and they can grow back so luckily I've been able to use those isolates from that have been stored um, by that but when I'm now trying to see if our findings can be uh, found in directly in sputum that's what I need it for so um, yeah that's what 
that's what um it's it's been a difficult part but I'm kind of getting to the end and that's the last part of my PhD so I'm hoping that I can still get a representative enough sample to to be able to show something there. Well, that's amazing to know that you know we've got the CF registry of data, but it sounds like there's also the separate CF registry of uh, um Brill. Um, so we've got a question for for Diana, which I suppose um, it it might seem like a, a basic question, but your, your your presentation was about the CFTR protein moving, and I suppose the yeah, the obvious question is, well, why is it important whether or not this protein moves? Um, so, um, as I said before, the CFTR protein is like a machine. And in order for it to work, uh, it needs to move. So understanding how different cogs and gears um, move together to make the protein work um, can help us find ways to influence this, for example, with medicines. And I think that also feeds into Polly Gibbs' question. Um, so usually when there's a mutation in the, in the protein, it often causes the protein to have less movement than expected. Um, so I'm investigating how Ivocaftor fixes this problem and makes the protein move and therefore work despite the protein. Um, and uh, it's, it's an effective treatment for people with cystic fibrosis. Um, do I also answer, Polly? Do I go into the next question? So, uh, Polly, I'm sure you're more than clever to understand what I'm doing. <laughs> Um, and yes, that's, that's what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping to shed light on what I look after moves within CFDR, uh, and to hopefully make it that, um, first of all, the people that the um, people with cystic fibrosis that have gating mutations, uh, that are not fully uh, healed by uh, Ivocaftor, um, that maybe I can, maybe that causes it to um, increase the way it rescues uh, those mutations. And also for the people that um, don't have access to um, modulators, they don't work very well on those, they have access, but they don't work very well on them. So thank you. Well, um, got one. We've got a question from Angie, but I just, I just wanted to ask one um, first. Um, and this is for Lucille, but I guess it potentially sort of overlaps into into Michaela's work. So um, the question for you, Lucille, is. is is it possible to have more than one different type of Burkholderia? You talked about them. Can you have more than one at the same time? And if you do, might they compete? You know, is that sort of like what Michaela's looking at? Would 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 having more than one be worse? Um. So from from what the research shows is usually when you have one Burkholderia, what happens is if another one comes in, depending on the species or the type of Burkholderia, is one will take over. So it's a bit like Pseudomonas when it gets established, it's really hard for another type to grow there. So usually you you might have two at the same time, but not for really long. And one is generally going to take over the whole space, basically. Um, so yeah, and then some um, are much worse than others. So for example, some species of Gladiolae are quite more dangerous than multivarans because multivarans is considered quite mild um, in terms of how it can make you feel was seeing the specia glidurally they will produce quite nasty things that makes you a lot sicker so um yeah that's what the research is showing in book but it's it's kind of depending on each bug acts a bit differently um so staff is going to work differently so it's going to work differently well thank you so i'm going to go with Angelo's question now and he's sort of addressed it to all of you so I think we're, we're close to the end of question time. So I'll uh, give you the question and maybe if you can answer in the order that you that you spoke earlier. Um, and it's it's not necessarily about the content of what you were 
what your talks were, but it was what drove you to research these topics within CF? So I guess what's what's your motivation for for the research that you're doing? So if you're going in order, um, yeah, just just a, like one sentence, in, in very brief. Um, I chose this um, area to research into in CF cystic fibrosis because it kind of bugs me that Ivacaftor has a, such a good effect on some mutations and um, a smaller effect on others. So I'd like to help that. Thank you. Um, so I chose this project to work on because uh, I researched another type of diabetes previously and I was interested in um, this type of diabetes, how um, in this case of the changes of the exocrine pancreas is leading to diabetes and to understand this better. Um, I started working on Bogdo in my undergrad and we were looking at um, so all the biopesticides, um, and then I kind of derived from it. My master's working on polymicrobial interactions, so looking at when Bogdo interacts with other bacteria, sort of like Michaela does. Um, and so then with this project derived, which was kind of a combination of the infection aspect of Bogdo mixed with the antibiotic, that was really kind of the best of both worlds for me. Um, and that's really what motivates me to work on that PhD. And so I, obviously the pseudomonas and staph are the most common bacteria. So I really wanted to kind of understand um, their interactions and um, be able to study that further. So yeah, James' um, PhD really fit perfectly. I studied it for my master's as well, and it was just a, a great continuation to be able to, to study it further. Wonderful, thank you. Um... Yeah, I mean, I think this just goes back to what I said at the very beginning. Firstly, I think as a CF community, we're in safe hands with all sorts of clever people like you. And um, and that also it's, it's really apparent that it's, you know, more than just a, a day job for you. Um, yeah. Um, and, oh, just we've got four minutes left. Um, and there was one unasked question just for Michaela um, about what comes next with the data analysis. So I'm guessing this is about the data you, you've already got rather than, or, or I guess it might be about what, what would be the next stage of the research. So yeah, the, this is for the data that I've already got. So um, Life Arc, who is a charity that's working closely with the CF Trust, um, have agreed to collaborate with us on it. And, you know, we've done this uh, really interesting statistical analysis, but they're going to have uh, two data analysts doing some fancy machine learning um, algorithms and AI to be able to figure out, you know, exactly what these interactions between different bugs are doing and how that's affecting people clinically. Um, and it, yeah, it just all like, comes back to what Rob said about how useful it is to have all of this data available. And we are trying to, um, now I've spent a lot of time cleaning this data set and merging it with other data sets. We've got a really good data to be able to pass on forward for other people to continue doing this work. And that's thanks to everyone who contributes to the registry. Brilliant, thank you. So it sounds like we asked the AI question earlier to the wrong person, but <laughs> um, real well, I think that's all we've got time for. There is one um, thing in the chat from Eshwa, who I'm guessing might be Lucille's supervisor, um, uh, about a bit more background about Burkholderia and in particular the answer about avoiding onions uh, is that actually practicing basic hygiene um, you know, when you're handling any food and preparing food should be enough to uh, mitigate that, that risk of having an onion that has Burkholderia on it. Um, so I think in the chat, we have now also got a few links that have been posted and possibly a QR code. Um, and that will cover the recordings from the event itself. As I said, it was um, a virtual conference. So there is a, a, a video record of, of the whole thing. Um, there will be a recording of tonight's CF Live um, once it's edited and, and done. Um, 
And all that remains is for me to say thank you, everyone, for attending tonight. Thank you to our four um, guest speakers and thank you for my fellow um, CF, people with CF who helped to uh, prepare this talk so that hopefully you will manage to gain a lot from it. Um, good night, everyone. Hope you've had a, a nice hour. <laughs> Go and enjoy the rest of your evenings. Thanks.